All right. Well, I tell you, this is one of those times. The message I have for you today is Mike has shared, a, I'm going to talk about dirty feet. And uh, as part of it anyway. But um, God started really putting on my heart uh, very strongly, actually, to talk about forgiveness. And, uh, and then after I uh, started moving in that direction, it just seemed like everywhere I turn, I see people using the scriptures that I was going to use. And it's, it's just like a lot of confirmation that uh, this is the direction to go. So today, today is just going to kind of barely get into that area. But then the Sunday after Marvin's here, uh, I'm going to really, if you can all be here that Sunday, uh, be, please be here. Uh, I think it's, I mean, today's message is important, but I believe that's going to kind of like be the, uh, uh, the finale, if you will. You know, like fireworks, you got, they're all good, but then you got the finale. And I think that's going to be kind of the finale of, of the message on forgiveness. And it's more of a how-to kind of a, a word. But some people want to forgive, but how do I do it? You know, that's what we'll be talking about then. Uh, today we're just talking more about the need for forgiveness, okay? All right, John chapter 13. And we'll begin reading with verse 1 through verse 5. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that His hour had come, that He should depart from this world to the Father, having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Let's pray. Father, I just ask that you would open our hearts to receive what your Spirit would say to us today. Father, I pray that you would take this Word and use it, Lord, to uh, bring us forward, to bring us past uh, maybe issues uh, that have gone on in our lives, Father, if there be unforgiveness, I pray that you would speak and release today. And Lord, we're careful to give you the praise for all that you do. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. Try to imagine for a moment what was in the mind of Jesus at this time where we read, first of all, that Jesus knew His time was about up. Jesus knew what lay before Him. He knew that He was about to be tortured. He knew that His time on this earth was about to end. And He's going to go back to be with the Father. And He was willing to endure all of that because He loves those who are in this world. He loved and loves those that are in this world to the point that He is willing to die to pay the price for our sin. Isn't that awesome? when you think about what He's done for us. The Father loved us so much that He sent His Son into this world to die and pay the price for our sin. And I know that doesn't sound like anything new. That's not a revelation this morning. But how often do we just kind of not really think about it? How often do we just kind of say, yeah, I know that. But to think that He came, that He might die, to pay the price so that we might live. Forever. Amen? Where would we be if He didn't do it? I tell you, you don't even want to think about that. In Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 10, it reads there, But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood. You know, there's a lot of churches today that want to take the blood out of the pulpit. It's like, well, we don't want to talk about blood. That's gory. Well, you know what Jesus did for us is pretty gory. But He did it anyway, amen? And uh, I tell you, in this pulpit, you always hear about the blood. I mean, it's, it's not something we're going to skip over. 
this is not a politically correct church. And we'll be sensitive as we can be, but we're going to tell the truth. We'll tell it in love. We're not here to slam anybody. We're not here to, you know, uh, 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 try to pick on anybody. But, but we are going to speak the truth and, and we hope to do it with love. Amen? But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us much more than having now been justified by His blood. We shall be saved from the wrath through Him. Everybody say through Him. Through Him. Nobody else. We're saved through Him. Through Jesus Christ and Him alone. For if when we were enemies, when we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. With all that He went through, I want you to notice it says that He loved them to the end. There in verse 1. He loved them until the end. You know, we may start out loving someone, but when they treat us wrong, we're done. Hey, I love you. Oh, what did you do to me? Forget you. I'm done with you. I don't need this. And it's kind of one, you know, it's kind of, you mess, you mess over, you mess me over, we're done. But look how many times Jesus was messed over. But he still loved them until it tells us until the end. You know, there's a song we used to sing, I want to be more like you, Jesus. I want to be more like you. I want to be a vessel you can work through. I want to be more like you. And, uh, you know, when we think about that song, it sounds good and it's sweet and it's got a nice melody. But think about what you're really saying when you say, I want to be more like you. If we were more like Him, church, it would not be one and done. Amen? It's true. It would not be, well, you hurt my feelings, so... I'm not having anything to do with you anymore. You know, we can get our feelings hurt so easy today, can't we? You know, I mean, I mean, you know, I think about how easy we get our feelings hurt, and then I think about the Apostle Paul. Can you imagine him? Well, you beat me with a whip, and you stole me, and you did this to me, and I, I'm just done with you. No, he'd get back up, brush it all off, and say, I'm here for the glory of God, and, and march right on. Amen? You know, I mean, I've had my feelings hurt over the years. But church, you know, we just can't give up. Amen? This is too important. I want to be more like Jesus. You know, we were sinners, it tells us. We were haters of God. But it tells us that He loved us until the end. Up until His last dying breath, He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Can you do the same? You know, sometimes I feel like saying, but God, they know exactly what they're doing. You understand? <laughs> but that's, that's what we got to remember. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Amen? Yeah. I looked at several other translations of this verse where it says He loved them up until the end. And uh, they include, He loved them to the end completely. He loved them up until the end totally. He loved them up until the end to the highest degree. That's pretty awesome. And think of who He was loving. Right up at the end, He was hanging on a cross. They beat Him. They put a crown of thorns on His flesh. They spit on Him. They mocked Him. But He loved them right up until the end completely, totally, and to the highest degree. He loved them. He didn't love them just a little bit. Sometimes that's the way we want to act. Well, I've got to love you, so I'll love you a little bit. No, He loved them totally and completely to the highest degree. So with all this in mind, this is all going on in His, in his mind, what does Jesus do? Amongst betrayal, thinking about being crucified, knowing that He was about to leave this world, what does He do? He gathers some water and a towel, and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. Now, back in the day, they didn't have sidewalks and Nike running shoes. 
they were they wore sandals and they walked on dirty, dusty, muddy paths. And they wore sandals. Now I want to be honest with you. It's been a long time since I've had dirty feet. Mainly because I always wear socks and, and I wear shoes. And they might get a little sweaty sometimes. But other than that, they're, they're pretty clean. But I can remember as a kid, we'd run almost from morning to late at night, barefooted, all over the neighborhood, through the dust, through the dirt, through the mud. And I remember coming home and my feet would just be filthy. If I were able to get into the house and take a shower, I mean, dirt, mud would just run all over. Usually you had to take a hose, you know, and spray them all off before you went into the house. And I can remember uh, how dirty they were. Well, this is what we're talking about with these disciples' feet. They were dirty. They were filthy. They were probably smelly. But that's the condition. And we see Jesus bending down with a towel and water and washing these filthy feet. Back when we first started, I, I preached on a message on washing feet. And, and I believe I had uh, Tom and Mike came up and I washed their feet. You know, that was no big deal. Matter of fact, I called them the night before. I said, hey, make sure you've got on some clean socks. And not for my benefit. You know, I just didn't want them to be embarrassed. You know, whenever they came up. But I did it as an illustration, but also did it just as an act of service because, you know, they, they helped me so much and I just wanted to show my appreciation and, and, and love for them. So, but you know, that was an easy thing to do. I mean, we're going to get in here in just a moment and see how it may not have been quite so easy to hear what Jesus did. So, why did He do this? It was another way of showing His great love for the disciples. The next demonstration of His love would be when He was hanging on a cross. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus washing those stinky feet. Jesus is awesome. But wait a minute, look at verses 15 through 17. What does it say there? For I have given you an example. <laughs> I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed, blessed are you if you do them. We are instructed to do likewise. But notice he says at the end, blessed are you if you do them. So if we follow his example, we are blessed. Now, there are some churches, there are some denominations that practice foot washing. And I believe that's fine. There's, there's not a thing wrong with that. But I do not necessarily believe we are instructed to do that. We are instructed to love and to demonstrate love. This is just a, a particular way at that point in time that Jesus would serve them. There's really not a lot of service in and, and uh, you know, be washing your feet when you come in to church. Because your feet aren't dirty, they're not stinky, they're not muddy. You know, it's not really refreshing, it'll probably be more embarrassing to you than anything else. So, you know, he's not saying, okay, now I want, I want all of you to have foot washing services every Sunday. Again, I'm not knocking anybody for doing it. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. But I'm just saying I do not believe that he's particularly talking about go wash people's feet because I've washed your feet. But he's saying, go serve people because I've served you. Go love people because I've loved you. Do as I have done, and you will be blessed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we're instructed to do the same. And it tells us that we shall be blessed. Now, I have no problem washing a friend's feet. I mean, I wouldn't have any problem washing any of your feet right now. You know, you'd be more embarrassed or whatever than I would be, for sure. I mean, I know I would be. I mean, I'd rather wash your feet than you wash my feet. You know, I mean, it's, I think we all probably kind of feel that way. But I want you to think about this. Judas was in the room with the disciples. 
And we know that he was about to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that Judas was about to betray him. So this is going on in the same room. His betrayer is right there with him. So do you think that Jesus washed everybody's feet and looked at Judas and says, I ain't washing your feet. He washed his enemy's feet. And he instructs us to do the same thing. And, and Hebrews 9.22, I want to digress just for a moment, but I'll bring it all back in. Hebrews 9.22, it reads, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So it's commonly known that blood had to be shed for there to be forgiveness. As a matter of fact, all the Old Testament uh, sacrifices, every one of them were a type and shadow of things to come. They were all pointing to the ultimate sacrifice, which is Jesus Christ. Amen? Uh, you wonder, why did they you know, shed the blood of all those animals? Well, it was temporary covering, but more than that, it was all a picture of Jesus coming and shedding His blood for us. And then uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, uh, it, it gives a list of sins, you know, the, talking about adultery and, and uh, talking about drunkenness and this and that. And it goes through this whole list of sins. And then in verse 11, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, listen to what it says. And such were some of you. But you were washed. Hallelujah. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. That's awesome right there. You see, old things have passed away. Amen. Yeah. And behold, all things become new. Only the blood of Christ can wash us from our sins. Only the blood of Christ can cleanse us from our unrighteousness. And when the disciples saw Jesus hanging on the cross, they realized that He not only washed their feet physically, but that He was washing their sin away as well. That was a spiritual washing when they, He died upon the cross. And when you receive that sacrifice that He made for you, you have a spiritual washing. You're made clean. You're washed of all unrighteousness. You're given the gift of righteousness. Amen? He again is demonstrating His love by dying to pay the price for our sin. Later on, in verse 34, Jesus gives them a new command. And listen, it was a command, not a suggestion. You know, we don't like words like uh, authority. We don't like words like command. You know, well, I, I prefer suggestion. Jesus suggests we do these things. No, He commands us to do certain things. Amen? And what is it He commands? A new commandment I give to you. Oh, no, another one? <laughs> you know, there's two commands that, that cover all... You know, people get hung up on Ten Commandments. Well, you know, if, if you do the two commandments that Jesus commands us, you, you won't break into the Ten Commandments. Love the Lord God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. You won't steal. You won't have adultery with His wife. You won't, you know, do any of that if you love the Lord God and, and love your neighbor as yourself. He said, A new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you and that you also love one another. Notice He says again, as I have loved you. He is telling us to love each other the way He loves us. And He loves us. All of us. He loved Judas. The one that was about to betray Him. He washed Judas' feet. Now put yourself in Judas' sandals for a moment if you would. How would you feel if the one you were about to betray... I mean, it's, it, we read earlier that the devil already put it in his heart to betray Jesus. How would you feel if the one that you were about to betray all of a sudden just kneels down and starts washing your stinky feet? Extending love. Serving you. Extending that kind of grace towards you. How would you feel? In Romans chapter 12, verse 20, listen to what it says there. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty... Give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Now back early on in my Christian walk, I thought that meant that will really burn him up. 
You know, <laughs> you know, you have an enemy, and and uh, I'll get you. I'll be nice to you. You know, and that'll really just tear them up. And that's not what it's saying at all. But it talks about heaping coals of fire on their head. You know, back in the day, the way they would carry things would be on their head with a basket. And they would carry fruit or whatever it might be. They would carry what they would actually go to a neighbor's house, maybe borrow some coal, and on top they would put some burning coal. I mean, it wouldn't be like right on their head, but it, you know, it'd be like heaping coals of fire on their head. In other words, you're blessing them so that they can come and and and, and take that home and warm their homes. So basically, what he's saying here is this. If you do these nice things to him, you're going to warm their heart. You see, you're going to you can win them over by by doing good unto those who do bad to you. If you just do bad back to them, it just escalates. But how, how you know how can we relate that to, to today? And the thought came to me. Let's say there's somebody that you just really don't like. They just burn you up. And they burned you several times, and and you know the kind of person you see and. When you see it, you look the other way. Anybody ever have one of those things? You know, it's like, oh, you know, and then, and then you want to walk away and hope they didn't see you or something like that. I mean, I hate that kind of stuff, don't you? I'm the kind of guy I always want to walk up to them and get it over with, get that awkwardness over with, and just, you know, get it done. And uh, so anyway, here's the here's the thought that came to me. Let's say you're driving down the road, that person, you know, that person, you see them on the side of the road, broke down in their car. Okay. So, how you can minister to them or, 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 or do good unto them, you pull over, they're out of gas. You say, well, go ahead and get in. We'll go down and get you some gas. Well, then pay for their gas. Drive them back. Put the gas in the car for them. Have a good day. Okay? Now, let me just add this. And this is something not for next week. When Marvin's here the following week. When I talk about forgiveness, that does not always mean you've got to have a relationship with them. Okay? So we'll talk about that more later. But, but I mean, I think that even makes you feel better. I mean, you could just go by and go, ha, 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 sucker, you know. <laughs> and, and, and some people can feel good about that, maybe. Oh, I just showed them. I laughed at them. But you're not really going to help the situation. But if you go help them and pour some gas in their form and pay for it, and then go on your way. You know, maybe it's time we stop, as believers, that we, you know, we stop looking at how dirty our brother's feet are and talk about all the dirt on their feet and start thinking and thinking poorly of them. Take out a towel and wash their feet. Amen. And again, I don't mean that literally, because again, the picture Jesus is painting is to serve, not necessarily in that particular way. The Bible tells us that love a multitude of sin. In 1 Peter 4, 8, And above all things, have fervent love one for another, for love will cover a multitude of sin. You know what that means? That means we don't just go out exposing people's sin. It doesn't mean you're not to confront them with their sin, but you, you, know, you don't try to expose their sin. You know, when I get a stain on the carpet, I've learned you don't just start rubbing it out. You rub it in. If you rub it out, you just make it bigger and bigger and bigger. Amen? But if you rub it in and, and pull it up, and that's the way we need to do when people sin. We have a responsibility to confront. It's called restoring our brother. Amen? When you do that, you go with the right attitude. You know, you don't go like, hey, i got it all together and I'm Mr. Holy and, and you're not and here's what you need to do. No, first of all, you spend time praying for that person and get the mind of God and the heart of God for that person. Then you go to them and confront them with whatever it's doing. Because, you know, sin harms. If you go with the right attitude, you're not going to set them straight. You're going to set them free. Amen? And that's why you would confront somebody with sin. And it tells us where to do that. It, you know, we're not just a wink at evil. It's just, you know, telling the truth, speaking the truth in love. But, you know, we've had so many Christians. I mean, you take somebody famous that messes up, man, we just want to bury them. But that's not what we're supposed to do. Love covers a multitude of sin. You know, there's a thing called restoration. We're called to restore our brother back to the Lord as they fall away from the Lord. Then in Matthew 18, 21 and 22, it says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And he thinks he's being really wonderful. He said, up to seven times? And a lot of us think that's quite a few times, amen? Up to seven times? 
Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. I think that's 490, isn't it? And, and I think that's in a day. And that's a lot of forgiving going on, amen? Let me just kind of add this to that. I don't necessarily believe that just means, you know, this person comes and sins against you, I forgive you. They come and sin against you, I forgive you. You know, it may just be the thought of that sin coming back to you. Yes, yeah, that's, that's the rough part about forgiveness is forgetting, amen? Let me just tell you this. I told Mike, I said, I bet I end up preaching my next sermon because I was getting ahead of myself. But, but uh, whatever, uh, uh, when, when you think about that, uh, we, we're told to forgive, we're commanded to forgive. But you know, it really doesn't say, it says He forgets, but it doesn't tell us that we have to forget. Now, there's something else to that, but you've got to come back to hear the rest of that. Okay? But, uh, uh, but a lot of times that's the problem because, you know, the enemy just keeps bringing it back to you. Look what they did to you. Look what they did to you. And if the enemy doesn't do it, somebody else will. Amen? You know, you go, oh, there's this one place I go, and every time I go there, man, I just can't believe it. I mean, this has been years ago. I'm like, really? I don't want to talk about that. You know, it's done. It's watered under the bridge. It's, it's over. We don't need to talk about that anymore. You know, uh, and, and that's what to help you forget is just leave it, amen. And I, I, I said this you know, uh, last week. I think it was. I don't know of anybody that I have unforgiveness toward. And that's a blessing. That is a blessing because that means I'm not carrying all that baggage. You know, you've heard it said before. Unforgiveness is hurting you worse than it is the person that did it all against you. So. Every time that thought comes back, you're just like, no, I forgave him of that. Comes back again. hundred times in a day, no, I forgave him of that. I can't remember her name, but she was the founder of Red Cross. And uh, somebody came into her office and they said, so and so's here to see you. Remember what she did to you? And she said, I distinctly remember forgetting that. <laughs> see, and that's kind of where we got to be at. Amen? They might try to resist the cleaning. You, know, you go to serve them. What are you doing? You're not going to do that for me. Uh, in in uh, John 13, 8 and 9, Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said, Well then, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands, my head. I mean, he's like, hey, I want to part with you. So just wash me all. But Jesus went on to say there, uh, Mike doesn't have that up there, but he went on to say, he who is bathed needs only to have his feet washed. You know, even if they resist our love, we're still to extend it. And what Jesus was saying, if, you, if you've been bathed, you only need your feet washed. You know, that's like, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've been bathed in the blood of Christ. And you don't need to go to church every Sunday and get saved every Sunday. But you might need to wash your feet. Amen? You don't need, you don't need to get saved all over, but, but you, you might need to go to the Lord and, and confess. Because it goes on to say in 1 John 1, 9, and we'll close with this, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you know what confession is? Just agreeing. Lord, what I did wasn't right. I'm sorry. You know, just help me and strengthen me that I, I get away from that and don't do that again. That's pretty simple, isn't it? That means a lot. Just think if your kid came to you and said, you know, Dad, Mom, you know, I did this. And, no, I shouldn't have. Uh, you know, please forgive me. Well, you know, Mom and Dad already forgave me. Amen. Just like God's already forgiven us. But, it, but it's good to go up and say, forgive me. I know I've done wrong. And a loving parent would just say, oh, thank you. And I'm going to help you. Amen. Besides that, what do they say? Confession is good for the soul. <laughs> you just let them get it off their back. And we go to God and confess our sin. He's letting us Get it off that weight. He's letting us get that weight off. It says, cast all your care upon Him because He cares for you. You know, sin can be a care, amen? 
and just cast it off, confess it, say, Lord, I agree this is wrong. I don't want it in my life anymore. Help me. And I'm going to talk about this next time as well. But sometimes it's not other people that we have a hard time forgiving. It's ourselves. And we'll touch on that as well. So, wash somebody's feet. Amen. And the Holy Spirit will lead you how to do that. Now, don't just jump out there and say, okay, well, I'm going to go buy this person some gas. You know, well, make sure it's a way of serving them. A way of humbling yourself. You know, it says if we humble ourselves before Him, He will exalt us. Amen. And go on to our enemy and humbling ourselves, God will exalt us. Amen. It's a good way to get rid of pride, too. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the wisdom of your word. And Lord, we just ask that you would uh, help us to apply what you've spoken to our hearts today in a way that's genuine, in a way that is helpful, in a way that could perhaps even restore or at least take away uh, uh, the uh, animosity and even hatred in some cases. Lord, I just pray that you would just set your people free in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Everybody said? Amen. 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 God bless you.